Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. It's hard to believe it's been almost nine months now since Nvidia unveiled its first Ampere-based product, the GeForce RTX 3080. Though I suppose it might have also felt like an eternity for those of you who've been trying to get one for the past nine months or so. The RTX 3080 was a hugely exciting product when it was first released back in September of last year. It offered 20% greater performance on average over the RTX 2080 Ti with a suggested retail price that was around 40% lower. The only issue of course being the fact that you couldn't really buy it as it sold out in seconds and then tracking one down at the MSRP a few months after release was extremely difficult and really verged on impossible. Now nine months later it's still virtually impossible to get your hands on an RTX 3080 with all retailers still out of stock and of course it's absolutely impossible to get one anywhere near the MSRP as cards are regularly selling on eBay for over $2,000 US. Since the release of the 3080, NVIDIA has also spat out a fully unlocked version of the GA102 silicon called the RTX 3090, and it costs a cool $1,500 US. Basically, it made no sense whatsoever, and I said as much in my day one review last year. After that, we got the RTX 3070, which was based on the smaller GA104 die, and at almost 40% smaller, it's possible for NVIDIA to get many more of these dies out of a single wafer, and it would seem as a result, supply has been slightly better, but ultimately still quite terrible. Also sharing the GA104 die is the RTX 3060 Ti, probably the hardest to find of all the Ampere-based GPUs, and that's because NVIDIA's been prioritised in the higher margin 3070, and with seemingly strong yields, there's been little need or incentive to produce the lower margin 3060 Ti. Then most recently we received the GeForce RTX 3060 based on the 300mm squared G0106 die, and it's meant to cost $330 US, but of course you can't buy it and you certainly can't get one for anywhere near the MSRP. So here we are, gamers still can't buy a graphics card in mid 2021, or at least not easily, and pricing is still sky high. Ideally, we'd like to see AMD and Nvidia release sub $300 US products, which would help to ease the supply issues and give gamers a better chance of buying a graphics card at a more reasonable price. But rather than do any of that, Nvidia's refreshing GA102 with the GeForce RTX 3080 Ti. Yep, another super expensive GPU just nine months after releasing the first set of super expensive GPUs that you still can't buy. So why are they doing this? Well, in short, to make more money. At least that's my take. Now, if you don't believe Nvidia is selling GPUs directly to miners, which happens to be our opinion, we believe it's the AIBs and or distributors who are selling to miners in large volumes. So if that's the case, Nvidia's missing out on a lot of money here. Of course, they're still doing very well out of the RTX 3090 sales, but letting go slightly defective GA102 silicon for less than half of the price probably stings quite a bit right now. So rather than do that, they've segmented further with the RTX 3080 Ti, allowing them to maximise profits of silicon that's not quite good enough to be an RTX 3090. Meaning rather than sell a good portion of that defective silicon as a $700 product, they can now extend the profit margin by roughly 70%. This all means that the RTX 3080 Ti exists purely to make more money. Shocker, I know. And in an effort to convince you that it's worth more than the RTX 3080, the 3080 that you can't buy right now anyway, they're throwing in an extra 2GB of VRAM. Couple that with an 18% increase in cores and the wider 384-bit memory bus, and you basically have an RTX 3090 with half the VRAM. We're talking about just 2.5% fewer cores than the 3090. Even at 4K, the RTX 3090 is just 13% faster than the 3080 on average, so you can expect the 3080 Ti to be very similar to the 3090 in terms of performance, and likely only around 10% faster than the 3080. That makes the 3080 Ti about as pointless as the 3090, given that at MSRP it should cost a level 70% more than the 3080 for maybe 10% more performance, so well beyond the point of diminishing returns. That's probably not a great way to start this review, but there's really no mystery here. Sometimes with these refreshes we get an odd mix of core and memory configurations, but that's not the case this time. The 3080 Ti has basically the same memory subsystem as the 3090, with a few less cores. With that said, let's go over a few benchmarks using the Founders Edition model, and please note all benchmark results are based on AMD and Nvidia GPUs running at the official specifications, so no factory overclocking. In total, I've tested 12 games at 1080p, 1440p, and 4K, 
but we're only going to look at the data for a few of the titles while the rest will be made available to our Float Plane and Patreon members. But of course, the all important dozen game average data will be included in this video. We've also got some power overclocking and ray tracing data to go over as well. It's also worth noting that all of this data is fresh and this is the first time it's being made available. After weeks upon weeks of testing, we now have all of our data up to date on the new Ryzen 9 5950X test system, which is being configured with 32 gigabytes of dual rank dual channel DDR4 3200CL14 memory. Okay, let's get into the results. First up, we've got the Death Stranding results at 1080p, and here the 3080 Ti delivered 3090 light performance. We're talking a 1 to 2 FPS margin here, and that meant the 3080 Ti was just 4% faster than the 3080, but quite a bit slower than the 6800 XT and 6900 XT. Increasing the resolution of 1440p allowed the 3080 Ti to match the 6800 XT while it was again delivering 3090 light performance. This also saw it beat the 3080 by a 9% margin, so not far off the 10% margin I was expecting to see. Then finally at 4K, the 3080i matched the 3090 exactly with 121 FPS on average, making it just 2.5% slower than the 6900 XT. It was also 13% faster than the RTX 3080, so again basically what we were expecting to see. Moving on to the Watch Dogs Legion results, we find more of the same. That is to say that the RTX 3080 Ti is basically an RTX 3090 with half the VRAM. The 3080 Ti did slip behind the 3090 at 1440p, though here it was still only 5% slower, but still 12% faster than the RTX 3080. So again, basically where you'd expect a product of this configuration to sit. Then at 4K, the 3080 Ti was just 3% slower than the RTX 3090, and 13% faster than the 3080, making it just 5% faster than the Radeon RX 6900 XT. Of course, in a normal market, if you cared about value, you'd get either the 6800 XT or RTX 3080. Next up, we have Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Here we're looking at 96 FPS on average at 1080p using the maximum in-game quality settings. This meant that the 3080 Ti was just 4% slower than the 3090 and just 3% faster than the 3080. Then at 1440p, it slotted in right between the 3080 and 3090 with 82 FPS on average. It's also worth noting that while Watch Dogs Legion is an NVIDIA sponsored title, Assassin's Creed Valhalla is an AMD sponsored title. That said, the Radeon GPUs do have a massive performance advantage here. The 6900 XT, for example, was a massive 28% faster than the 3080 Ti. Then moving to 4K, sees the RTX 3080 Ti average 59 FPS allowing it to match the RTX 3090 and 6800 XT, though it was still 11% slower than the 6900 XT. Moreover, when compared to the RTX 3080, we're looking at a mere 7% performance increase. The last game we're going to bother looking at is Cyberpunk 2077, and at 1080p, we're looking at comparable performance between the 3080 Ti, 3090 and 6900 XT. This meant that the 3080 Ti was just 10% faster than the original 3080. Then at 1440p, the new 3080 Ti is just 8% faster than the vanilla 3080 and 5% slower than the 3090. And we're also looking at comparable performance with the Radeon RX 6900 XT. Finally at 4K, the 3080 Ti was just 4% slower than the 3090 and 11% faster than the 3080 and then 6% faster than the 6900 XT. So similar margins to what we've seen in the previous three titles. So let's stop looking at the game benchmarks and just jump to the 12 game average. Okay, so at 1080p, across the 12 games tested, the GeForce RTX 3080 Ti is, and wait for it, basically an RTX 3090 with half the VRAM. We're talking about 2% slower on average, and just 6% faster than the RTX 3080. And for those of you seeking maximum performance for low resolution competitive gaming, the 6900 XT is slightly faster, offering 7% more performance on average. Now, at 1440p, the margins do grow a little bit. Here, the 3080 Ti was 4% slower than the 3090. That said, it's now only 5% slower than the 6900 XT. So overall, for rasterization performance, the Radeon GPU was a little bit faster in our dozen game sample, while offering even more VRAM. Finally, at 4K, the 3080 Ti is able to beat the 6900 XT, albeit though by just a 3% margin. It was again just 4% slower than the RTX 3090, and just 9% faster than the RTX 3080. Now, for a look at power consumption, and for this review, I'm going to focus on the total system results and put the NVIDIA PCAT testing on hold. 
I'd like to further investigate power consumption soon, as a few of you have pointed out that Nvidia is technically cheating here by offloading most of the scheduling work to the CPU, which increases CPU consumption and lowers GPU consumption. Therefore, measuring the total system provides a much more accurate picture of power usage. So here's a look at power consumption in Doom, and as you can see, the RTX 3080 Ti is very similar to the 3080 and 3090, again, slotting in between the two. In this example, the 3080 Ti was on average 6% fast than the 1600 XT in Doom, but pushed total system usage 9% higher. So RDNA 2 is slightly more efficient, though overall it's going to make very little difference to gamers. The margin would no doubt increase in AMD's favour if we isolated the CPU and GPU power usage, and that's something that we might start to do in the future. Okay, so here's a quick look at some ray tracing results, and we'll start with Metro Exodus Enhanced. All testing has been conducted at 1440p, and even without the aid of DLSS, we're seeing some pretty impressive frame rates here. The RTX 3080 Ti was good for 90 FPS on average using the highest quality in-game settings, though do note that variable rate shading was set to four times. Anyway, because the RTX 3080 Ti is basically an RTX 3090, the ray tracing performance is also basically the same. That means titles that were designed with NVIDIA's ray tracing implementation in mind will perform pretty horribly on Radeon GPUs, and that's what we're seeing here with the 1600 XT, which was 28% slower for normal ray tracing and 38% slower for Ultra. And of course, the GeForce GPUs are much faster again with DLSS enabled. Resident Evil Village works much better with Radeon GPUs, and as a result, the 1600 XT is a lot more competitive here. And despite still trailing the 3080 Ti by an 18% margin, performance overall was still very impressive. Of course, when discussing the 3080 Ti results, they're again best summed up by saying, it's basically an RTX 3090. Lastly, we have Watch Dogs Legion, and again, this is an NVIDIA-sponsored title that's optimised to work with NVIDIA's ray tracing implementation. As a result, the 1600 XT fares quite poorly, and the 3080 Ti again mimics 3090 light performance. Before wrapping up the testing, I do have a few AIB cards on hand, so we'll look at those and then do some very quick overclocking. Now, NVIDIA's own Founders Edition model appears to have just borrowed the cooler from the RTX 3080, as they appear physically identical. However, whereas the RTX 3080 featured a total board power rating of 320 watts, the 3080 Ti jumps up to 350 watts, so a 9% increase. This increased power saw the peak operating temperature rise by 2 degrees to 77 degrees, and the fan speed increased by 200 RPM to 2100 RPM. So as far as the end user experience is concerned, they're basically the same. Under these conditions, the FE model averaged a core clock speed of 1770 MHz, which is well above the advertised GPU boost clock, but of course that's how Nvidia's GPU boost works. Anyway, it's quite an impressive result for a dual slot graphics card, so bear that in mind as we take a look at the much bigger AIB models. We'll start with the ASUS RTX 3080 Ti Tough Gaming. This is basically just a copy and paste of the original 3080 Tough Gaming, and I've got to say that's not a bad thing as that model was excellent, as I discovered in a detailed review last year. This new 3080 Ti version works remarkably well, peaking at just 64 degrees in our stress test with a fan speed of 2000 RPM, and here it averaged a core clock speed of 1830 MHz. ASUS also sent over the new ROG Strix LC RTX 3080 Ti OC, and this is another highly impressive graphics card. Last year I checked out the ROG Strix LC version of the 6800 XT, which worked very well, and my only real criticism was the mess of cables that ran from the radiator to the graphics card. Thankfully though, ASUS took note and has now sleeved all of those cables with the liquid cooling tubes for a much neater package. Out of the box, this model peaked at just 49 degrees with a fan speed of just 1500 RPM, and that allowed for an average clock speed of 1920 MHz, so a 5% increase over the tough gaming model while running 15 degrees cooler and even quieter. Of course, this premium model will be much more expensive, but that's just par for the course when discussing these liquid cooled graphics cards. Then finally, also on hand is the new MSI RTX 3080 Ti Supreme X, a gigantic air cooled graphics card. To give you an idea of just how big and heavy this thing is, the Founders Edition model weighs 1,365 grams, and the Tough Gaming 1,400 grams. The Supreme X, though, it comes in at 1,930 grams, measuring 332 millimeters long, 140 millimeters tall, and 60 millimeters wide. It's a beast. But despite the massive dimensions, the results are less than impressive, as the card peaked at 78 degrees, so a whopping 14 degrees hotter than the Tough Gaming 
though it was a bit quieter as the fan spun at just 1600 RPM. Still, if noise normalised, I don't expect it will be able to beat the tough gaming. The calls also clocked at 1875 MHz, which is just a 2.5% increase over the tough gaming. Overall, not a bad result, it's just not particularly impressive given the weight and dimensions. Now here's a look at how they performed in Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1440p, both stock and overclocked. I was only able to squeeze 4% more out of the Found Edition model, hitting 1885 MHz on the cores, with the memory at 21 gigabits per second. The Tough Gaming was a mere 1% faster out of the box, and I was only able to squeeze a further 3% from it, hitting 178 FPS on average with a core frequency of 1900 MHz. The liquid-cooled ASUS ROG Strix LC was the most impressive, managing 178 FPS out of the box, and with the 1980 MHz overclock went up to 192 FPS, so that's an additional 8% performance, making it 13% faster than a stock RTX 3080 Ti. Not exactly amazing stuff, but that's GPU overclocking these days. The Supreme X was also able to match the ROG Strix LC out of the box, though it did fall short when overclocked, but this will come down to silicon quality, so don't read too much into the overclocking results here. They're an extremely rough guide at best. So there you have it, the new GeForce RTX 3080 Ti. As I've already said a number of times now, it's basically an RTX 3090 with half the VRAM, and while it is meant to be cheaper, uh, with an MSRP of $1,200 US, you can expect to pay RTX 3090 pricing, so thousands upon thousands of dollars. It's basically just a way for Nvidia to sell silicon that couldn't be binned for use in a 3090 at a higher price. Normally this sort of thing wouldn't be an issue. In fact, a refresh like this is kind of expected, but the reason this refresh is an issue is due to the fact that Nvidia hasn't finished releasing Ampere. I mean, where are the affordable sub $200 US models, or even the sub $300 US models? So come on Nvidia, read the room, there's just no way this release is going to sit well with gamers. And after all the talk about trying to help gamers with hardware limiters for mining, they then turn around and release the RTX 3080 Ti. It's just so damn tone deaf. I'm really not sure what else to say about this release. The RTX 3080 Ti is impressively fast, it is technically an excellent product, and the extra 2GB of VRAM is very welcomed. But at $1,200 US, and with the current stock issues, it's just a poorly timed release that frankly makes no sense, at least from a gamer's perspective. Now you might have noticed that I've skipped over our usual cost per frame graph, obviously with pricing the way it is, comparing the value of these products is rather pointless, and I see little sense in using these scalper prices as they're a bit all over the place and an average of what you're seeing online almost certainly won't be representative of what you'll be seeing in say a week from now. So in short, as I've already said multiple times now, like the GeForce RTX 3090 or Radeon RX 1600 XT, in a normal market, the 3080 Ti makes no sense, and in terms of cost per frame, you'd be far better off buying the RTX 3080, or if you really care about VRAM capacity, the 6800 XT. Anyway, I've really got nothing else to say on this one, apart from the fact that it looks like Nvidia were a bit blown out of the water at Computex this year by AMD's announcement of FSR, or Fidelity FX Super Resolution, which we'll be analysing shortly, or Tim will be analysing that for us shortly. But the fact that AMD is claiming to be improving the performance of older GeForce GPUs and potentially killing off DLSS in the process, well, that's just a horrific blow to Nvidia, and it came just ahead of this $1,200 US money grab. Yikes. Of course, AMD still has a lot to prove with FSR in terms of image quality and game support, but the announcement was impressive and certainly something that's being celebrated by gamers. I'm not sure we can say the same thing about the $1200 RTX 3080 Ti. If you enjoyed the video, give it one of those, please subscribe for more content. We will have the RTX 3070 Ti review shortly on the channel. Uh, of course, we will be analyzing stuff like FSR, and just plenty more GPU related content as well as all the usual stuff we do here at Harbour Unboxed. Also, if you'd like to support the channel directly, Floatplane Patreon, links for those are in the video description. That'll get you access to monthly live streams with Tim and myself where we discuss stuff just like this in a bit more detail or a bit more personally, uh, behind the scenes content, Q and A's, an awesome Discord server, great community over there. So if you're interested in joining that, again, links are in the video description, check it out. If not, perfectly fine and I would like to just thank you for watching this video. I'm your host Steve and I'll see you again next time.